hiding in the baggage, right? And we uh, talked about the fact that many times we too are not doing what we have been called to do. We're not serving the Lord. We're not stepping up uh, to, to do what we have been called to do because we're often what? Hiding in our baggage. Well, they dug Saul out of the baggage. Yeah, Saul out of the baggage. And now in uh, chapter 10, verse number 24, they've stood him up and Samuel said to all the people, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? Surely there is no one like him among all the people. So all the people shouted and said, Long live the king. Then Samuel told the people the ordinances of the kingdom and wrote them in the book and placed it before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, each one to his own house. Saul also went to his house at Gibeah. And the valiant men whose heart God had touched went with him. But certain worthless men said, how can this one deliver us? And they despised him, and they did not bring him any present, but kept silence. I saw this week in the news that someone won $400 million in the lottery. Did you see that down in South Carolina? Someone got the big payoff, and I'm sure they're very excited about that, and I'm sure whoever won is about to have a whole bunch of family reunions with estranged relatives, and a whole bunch of new friends are coming their way. No doubt some people will be envious of the $400 million winner, and yet other people, and most people I think, will be good sports and say, well, good for them, and maybe next time it'll be me. Because there's a certain randomness about the lottery that people actually appreciate and expect. People like the fact that there are no qualifications, and there's no competitions. There's just the random chance that you could win. You could be the next winner if you've got the lucky ticket. There are a few things in life that we want to be random about, isn't there? Lottery draws, first pick in the fantasy football draft. That's supposed to be random. However, the first pick suspiciously keeps falling to our league general manager. I'm not sure how Greg randomly gets the first pick every year. All I know is two years in a row, the manager manages to get it. There are a few things that we want chosen randomly, but most things in life, we don't want random choices, do we? When it comes to important decisions, we don't just say, let's just pull that one out of the hat, right? I'm going to take all the colleges I want to go to, I'm going to write it on a piece of paper, stuff it in a hat, and the one I pull out, that's where we're going to go. I'm going to put all the pictures of all of my classmates on the wall, and I'm going to throw a dart at them, and whoever it hits, that's who I'm going to plan to marry, right? No, we do not make important decisions that way. Every four years, all the names of all the citizens of the United States of America is going to go into a big basket, and we're going to roll it around, and then we're going to pull out a name, and whoever we get, that's the new president. Some of you think, hey, that's not a bad idea. No, actually, <laughs> that is not how we want to choose our leadership. When it comes to making those types of decisions, we want careful examination. We want scrutiny. We want betting and testing. Now, 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse number 24, Samuel says, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? whom the Lord has chosen. The Hebrew word translated chosen is bahar, has that kind of meaning. Not a simple blind selection, choose a number between 1 and 10. No, it, has me, it means to choose carefully after testing and examination. Everywhere this word is used in Scripture, it indicates well-thought-out choices. Actually, in the King James, you'll find that uh, the Old English uses the word choicest in many passages. It'll use the word choicest. Uh, old English, we laugh at that. Oh, it's so hard to say with its THs and its long endings. And we love to redact our words to simpler forms. But choicest is actually a really good word, isn't it? What does that indicate? What does that communicate? Of all the choices before me, this is the choicest choice. Choiciest choice, right? Am I confusing anyone? Maybe that's why we don't use those words anymore. We just would say what? Of all the choices, this one's the 
There you go. This one's the best, which is ultimately the point. If the Lord has chosen, then obviously this is the best choice. Why? Because the Lord has the inside scoop on everyone, doesn't he? He knows the thoughts and the intents of the hearts of everyone in the nation. He can weigh all the factors, look at all the sides. He can... Uh, inspect carefully, and after doing all that, the Lord has determined Saul is the choicest. He's the best. Pretty hard to argue with God's choices, don't you think? And all the people, when they heard the word of the Lord from Samuel, they all shouted what? Long live the king! Which is what you say when you prove you're being loyal and patriotic to the crown. Growing up, you all patriotically would sing, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty of thee, I sing. I, on the other hand, patriotically sang, God save our gracious queen, long live our no, that's enough of that, God save the queen. That's what we would sing. When you say, God save the king, or long live the queen, you are giving what? A blessing. If God is on your side, if God is granting you long life, it, it means that you are blessed. It means you're victorious, especially since these kings would lead their people into battle. So if you've got long life, that means you're probably winning all of the battles. Furthermore, monarchs don't rule for a term, do they? Monarchs rule for a, a lifetime. So if you're saying long live, that means you want this guy to rule over you. No. It's hard for us to imagine that. We're usually ready for a change of leadership after two years, but we put up with four. But imagine someone being the leader for a long lifetime. That's what we're talking about here. Those are some of the issues that come with uh, a king. But a king is what Israel wanted. And a king is what God has allowed them to have. That's a funny thing, isn't it? That God allows us to choose as well. He makes choices, but God also allows us to choose. He will tell us what he wants and what is right and what we ought to do, but then he steps back and he allows us to make some choices for ourselves. He never forces us to do what is right. However, we then have to live with the consequences of our decisions. And just like many people don't really know the consequences of their decisions until after the fact. Unlike God, who has all the information and advises us would be the best course of action, what would be the right move to make, we are very limited in our information. And many times we only know the consequences of our actions after the fact, when we are suffering with the consequences of our actions. What's the best way to avoid unintended consequences? What's the best way to minimize suffering in your life? Not that you can solve it all, but what's the best way to minimize it? Follow God's advice, right? Do what he says is a good choice. Stay on that straight and narrow. Easy to say, not so easy to do. Israel decided they'd prefer a king to rule over them, so God has chosen, verse 25, a king for them. And Samuel told them the ordinances of the kingdom in verse 25, and they wrote them in a book, and they, they presented it before the Lord, and now everyone knows what's to be expected. The king knows, and all the people knows how this thing is going to work. And now we have turned a new page in the life of Israel. We have now entered, finally, the age of the king. This is now the age of the kings in Israel's history. And now everyone has what they want, right? And everyone is oh so happy, right? Right. Verse 26. Saul also went to his house, and the valiant men whose hearts God had touched went with him. But certain worthless men said, how could this one deliver us? And they despised him. They did not bring him any present but they kept silence. 
The author observes two types of responses to God's choices for king. There are those who, what? What's the verbs? Those who go with the king, and there are those who despise the king. That's what we see here in the action. It doesn't say that those who go with the king, love the king, worship the king, blindly obey the king, that they chose King Saul over God, that they cleverly recognize that this is now where the power lies and, and that this is, it's good to be where the new money is. King Saul basically won the lottery. Let's be his new best friend. No, the commentary on their personal motives is that the Lord touched their hearts. That's why they're going with the king. They're serving because the Lord has touched their hearts, which once again communicates to us that these are God's choices, and God is in the action here. Now, there's something, there's nothing said about their, their personal motives, but there is a description of their character. What, what are they described as? The, the valiant men. The valiant men. Here's an important observation for the men this morning. Ladies, I'm going to talk to the men for a sec, okay? Uh, you're going to notice a slight change of style here when I do this. I, I wouldn't normally speak to everyone in this tone, but this is more effective for men. So feel free to listen in, but uh, don't take it personal, okay? Men, if I can even call you that, perhaps you're a mama's boy. Perhaps you are a big wuss. Hopefully, you have not done anything to have your man card revoked. But in case you have, listen up. I'm going to give you a surefire way of how to earn it back. Okay? What kind of men does God call to serve them? You're going to have to answer that question. What's the text say? What kind of men? Louder. Valiant men. Valiant men. What does valiant mean? Having or showing courage, possessing and acting with bravery and boldness. My brothers, it is the valiant men whose hearts are touched by God. It is the valiant men that go off to serve the king and to serve the country and to serve the Lord. Serving the Lord is not for the lazy man. Serving the Lord is not for the undisciplined man. Serving the Lord is not for the corrupt man, the apathetic man, the foolish man. Serving the Lord is for the, say it, valiant men. Did you notice this week that there's a battle going on? You see people being attacked, shot, killed. There's a battle going on. I'm not talking about physical. I'm not talking about the country. I'm talking about an enemy, about principalities and powers that are trying to take over people's lives and take over people's minds, destroying their bodies. Every day, people die. Their bodies are destroyed. Every day, families are destroyed. Every day, generations are destroyed. Churches are being attacked. Generations of people are being attacked. And lazy, undisciplined, corrupt, apathetic, foolish men cannot see that. They cannot see the battle going on. Only the man of God who is thoroughly furnished, who is properly equipped unto all good works, knowing the word of God, can see the battle, fight the battle, and overcome the battle. If you do not know the word, if you're not living by the word, if you, you will not be able to stand, you will not be able to be bold, you will not be able to overcome, you will fold like a deck of cards. And only the men who are able to fight and win are, according to 1 Samuel, the valiant ones. That is why God calls the valiant men to serve him. And it is the valiant men who answer the call of God. So if you're sitting on the sideline, not serving the Lord, not leading your home, you're sitting over there with your little pocketbook of money and your little toys, and you're not involved in the, the fight the spiritual battle, you're not fighting those battles, you're not pulling your own weight, you're not stepping up the shoulder of the load, you want to know why that is? It's because you're not a valiant man. Brothers, get equipped in the word. 
Learn how to use the sword of the Lord. It is your weapon. And stand up and fight this battle. It is the valiant men whose God touches their hearts and who serve the king. But in contrast, it is the worthless men, the ungodly or the wicked men who what? Despise. Despise the king. What does that mean to despise? We'd say hate, wouldn't we? We would say hate, but that's not quite the emphasis of the Hebrew word, bazaz, the Hebrew word. It means to scorn, to disesteem, to disdain. And so, you know, hatred, you know, is one way we would say it, but it's, it's really more disrespect, dishonor, to scorn and reject this choice of God's. The valiant are going to serve and support and honor. The wicked, in contrast, are what? Dishonoring, scorning, and rejecting. Now, if you, you notice in the text here, it's not open defiance. They don't boo and throw tomatoes at Saul. Uh, publicly, all they really did was what? They asked a question, right? Really, all that they said was, how can this one deliver us? I mean, that's an honest question, don't you think? I mean, yeah, Saul's a big guy, but, you know, he's kind of lacking in confidence. I mean, we just dragged him out from behind the baggage, remember? You know, it looks like he, you know, got some baggage there, and uh, he's got some issues, and uh, he's kind of questionable. And if he's a questionable pick, doesn't it stand to reason that you're going to have some questions? You know, there's nothing wrong with uh, questioning or questions especially when we're questioning fallen men in positions of leadership. Men need accountability. We need checks and balances in our lives, especially in positions of power, because abuse of power is a grave danger. But the questioning done here in chapter 10, it's not so much questioning men, rather it's questioning who. Samuel said, do you see who the Lord has chosen? Right? And we said earlier that that wasn't like random. That was carefully inspected choice. The question is not against Saul. The question is directed against the Lord's choice, which means it's questioning God, which is ultimately the root problem for Israel, not trusting God, not following his commands. Follow the logic here. The people reject Samuel as their leader. Ultimately, that was a rejection of who? Remember back in chapter 8, verse number 7, God said to Samuel, uh, listen to the voice of the people in regards to what they say. They've not rejected you, Samuel. They have rejected me, God says. They've rejected me. Now that God has stepped away from being the leader through the prophet, he's now given them what they chose, a king. He's chosen a king for him, and now they're rejecting the individual. They're rejecting God's choice. So once again, this isn't about Saul. It's about rejecting who? It's about rejecting God, whoever God's anoint. Why are they doing that? The text tells you because they're wicked, because they are wicked, and ultimately they don't want any of leadership in any form that God has put over them. It might be a king. It might be a pastor. It might be a husband. It might be a parent. It might be a police officer or a teacher or a judge. Some people just reject authority. And in doing so, they're rejecting who? God who places authority over us. But when you eject, reject God's authority, God's commands, you reject God himself. This is an epidemic that plagues our nation. People rebel against all positions of authority that God has instituted. They're rebelling against God. Now, look at their actions because it's, it's not what you would think. They're, it's not open rebellion or picketing or rioting. They're not politicking against Saul. What are their actions? They don't bring him a present, and they keep silence. Think about that for a moment. Did you know in the Old Testament, honor was always shown how? Two ways. By the words you spoke and by a gift you would bring. Speaking praises and giving gifts, just like the wise men. 
Remember in the Christmas story, when the wise men came to Jesus, what did they do? They worshipped him, and they presented him with gifts. Well, this might be the Old Testament, and this might be several thousand years old, but you know what, folks? It's still the same God. The author of this book is the God that we showed up here to worship this morning. So how is worship, how is honor illustrated in the Old Testament? By what you say and by what you you give. How is disdain and dishonor shown in 1 Samuel chapter 10? By saying nothing and by giving nothing. Now let me ask you this. Despite the overhead projector this morning, did you open your mouth and praise during our time of worship? Didn't have to be beautiful like Chris Taylor's voice or Michelle's, but did you try to sing praise? Those songs were giving glory to God, weren't they? During our time of worship, and that's why we do it, we're not asking, soliciting funds. We do this during the worship service because this is worship. During worship and praise, did you give a gift? Did you bring a gift to the Lord? Listen carefully, folks. These are not my words. This is not Pastor Rob's definition of these things. I'm just teaching you 1 Samuel chapter 10. That's all we do is we say chapter and verse and look at the word of the Lord when we do this stuff. If you won't open your mouth and shout praises, if you won't bring a gift, God sees that as disdain, as disrespect. God gave me life this morning. Did he give you life this morning? Anybody? Anybody alive in here this morning? An amen, someone? Amen. Thank you. Some, Rusty's alive, right? <sighs> Just breathed in God's air. That's God's air, right? I ate food this morning, the fruit of the earth that God created and replenishes. I ate some oatmeal with blueberries. We're both good. I prefer the blueberries more than the oatmeal. I put, actually, the kids tease me and say, are you going to have some oatmeal with your blueberries, Dad? But, you know, that's what I do, trying to, you know, help the heart out there. That's God's creation. Didn't he give us that food? Didn't he create that? I live in peace and safety. Unlike the church in Pakistan, when they stepped out of their worship, they got blown up. Probably that's not going to happen here. We live in peace and safety due to the leadership and the justice that God has placed over our land. Now, we love to boldly assert our independence, don't we? We like to act, and we like to owe nobody nothing. But that, deep down, is a rebellious spirit, the characteristics of a wicked person, because there is somebody that we owe something to. We owe God, and God deserves our honor, and he deserves the glory that is due his name. He deserves our gifts. He deserves our service. He deserves our loyalty. He deserves your and my life. God is our all in all. He deserves our all in all. So brothers and sisters, don't be like the wicked who give nothing and say nothing. Give your mouth to praise and to testify. Give to him your service. Give to him your life. Be valiant men and women for the Lord. Let us bow in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this time that we can come here to worship and praise and to give back. Just a small portion, Lord, but nonetheless to, to give credit where credit is due and to acknowledge all that we you've done for us and to give something back in, in, in praise and celebration. And Lord, help us to not be worthless men, to be, to be uh, the wicked who do not want to give and do not want to serve, who just want to be about themselves, who always reject authority and always reject your choices and your word and your principles. Help us to be valiant who will step up to lead and step up to serve and to step up and give glory to your name. Lord, may we be that type of people. May we get engaged into the battle, even though it's scary sometimes, even though it's hard sometimes. The spiritual battle's all around us, Lord. Help us not to back down. Help us to be thoroughly furnished properly equipped, and pull out the word of the Lord and stand for truth. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.